So if you could, uh, turn in your order of worship and stand for God's call to worship him. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make joyful noise to him in the song of For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Amen. Please remain standing for our first hymn. And that first hymn is number 68, We Praise Thee, O God, Our Redeemer.
Our passage this morning is from Galatians chapter 3. It is printed there in your bulletin for your convenience. We'll consider verses 15 through 22 this morning. Let us give this careful attention, brothers and sisters, for this is the Word of God. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So far the reading of God's word. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father and our God, we thank you. We praise you. And we come before you asking that your Holy Spirit would minister to all of us as your children this morning. As your word has been read aloud, we want to understand it, we want to grow in it, grow in our understanding, grow in our love for you. And we can only do that as you teach us. And so, Father, I ask for your blessing upon my thoughts and words, that they would glorify you alone, and that they would feed your sheep. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Well, we are roughly halfway through this letter uh, uh, to the Galatians written by the Apostle Paul, and I would bet that many of you are already thinking to yourself, come on, Paul, let's move on. Let's move on a little bit. I mean, you keep harping on this issue of justification by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. We get it. Do you? Do we? The fact of the matter is that the that we need to pay some notice of how much time by by some arguments, either a six-part or seven-part argument that he's putting forth, on this issue ought to tell us something. Whenever a, a, a master teacher belabors one point over and over again, you must ask yourself, is he just stuck and has nothing else to say? Or is it that important? It's the latter. It's that important that we get this right. And the church cannot say, we get it, let's move on. Because all throughout the ages, the church continues, even to this day, to struggle with the truth that salvation, justification, I'm gonna, I, I use those words interchangeably, especially in this journey through Galatians. Salvation is by faith alone and not by works. And the reason that I know that we still struggle with it is because there are so many things that the church comes along and wants to abandon the gospel, the good news of salvation by faith alone, to replace it with programs. And to focus our minds once again 
on you and what you do and your confidence of being right with God in what you do. Now, what we do is vitally important. And we've been saying that, and I'm saying it again to emphasize it. How we live the Christian life is vitally important. But it doesn't have anything to do with our salvation. And we need to be able to see that separation and that connection simultaneously and in perfect balance in order to be right, gospel-centered Christians. From last week. Last week, we learned a vital truth. There are not two peoples of God. There is not an Old Testament people of God called the Jews and a New Testament people of God called Gentile Christians. Last week we learned that God has one people. And if we, don't, if we didn't get it from last week, he's going to hammer it again with us coming up next week. There's one people of God, the descendants of Abraham, and what we found out last week is that Paul let us know that you all, me included, all of us are Abraham's children. We're his descendants, not his ethnic, not necessarily his biological, but his spiritual descendants, because we all do the very same thing that Abraham did. We believe God and believe his promises. That makes us his descendants. And everybody who does does that, regardless of their ethnic background, is a child of God, a child of Abraham. We also learned, again, that if you want to rely on the law for justification, if you want to be a Pharisee and hammer away at that, that you have to earn your way to heaven, then you better be willing to go all the way and recognize that you must keep the law perfectly. 99% is not a passing grade. Only 100% perfect obedience is a passing grade. And therefore we learned that Christ redeemed both Jew and Gentile believers and the blessing of Abraham comes through Jesus and him alone. Now, he's now building on that, those truths, further as he gives this next part of his argument. Paul is going to give us another Old Testament lesson to prove his point and to pull the rug out from under the feet of his uh, Jewish critics, okay, of his rabbinic critics at that time that were insisting on, yes, you need Jesus, but you also need these other things, including circumcision. So he's going to go back and take their own scriptures and pull the rug right out from under their feet. So here's what he says. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Once it's been signed and sealed, once that stamp, all agreements, both parties have been made, he's, he's, he's going to make an argument from the lesser to the greater. Here's what he's asking. The Lord made a promise to Abraham. Do you remember that? Go back to Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17. The Lord made promises to Abraham and they were unconditional promises I'm just going to do this for you I have chosen you and I'm going to pour out my blessing upon you and upon your seed your offspring seed and offspring are just the same translation of the same uh, word in the original text both are perfectly good translations seeds a little more technically uh, accurate but we know what he means by seed, offspring. So he's going to cause us to think about a human example. Even in, with us in legal agreements that we make all the time, once the agreement has been validated, signed, sealed, it's done with, you can't change it. You can't. Well, I understand that now we live in a time where if you can afford enough lawyers, I guess you can get out of anything practically. But, but that's, not the, that's, not the, that's not the situation 
that's envisioned here. Let me give you a, a, a real simple one. Uh, one of my grandparents, my paternal grandfather, sold cars almost his whole life. And uh, I would be willing to bet that most, if not all of you, have bought a car at least once in your life. And you sit down and, uh, you know, you go through all that uh, gyrations and talk back and forth. What do I have to do to get you into this Toyota today or whatever it is, right? And you back forth. And then you reach an agreement. I can live with this price. They can live with this price. You agree on a sales. And then you start signing your initials and on this contract that takes uh, 20 folds to get it to fit in an envelope. And you walk away. Now you own a car. You've agreed how much to pay for it. It's all been settled. Well, my grandfather, who sold cars, uh, like I said, for many, 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 many years, I never once ever heard of him being able to come home from work one day and say, you know what I did today? I called up that person that I sold that Buick to uh, two, three days ago, and I told them, you know, I've decided I want an extra $3,000 more for that. I'm changing the price and I want another 3000 How's that going to fly with you as the customer? I want to sell cars. You're all just sitting on your hands. I want to sell cars to you. Even though you're going to go along with it? Who's going along with it? Nobody's going along with it. And what are you going to say? I have a contract, Mr. Uh, crazy Man. I have a contract. Okay. That's the example that he's giving. He wants that kind of thing in our mind and say, okay, if that's true even among you humans, how much more is it true of God? That once he gives his word, once he makes a promise and it is ratified, validated, he will keep it. Do you think he's going to change the terms? Because that's what they're asking you to believe. And that's why he says here, This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years later cannot invalidate, cannot annul the promise that was already ratified. God doesn't come along after making the promises, the precious promises of salvation to Abraham and to his seed. He doesn't come along 430 years later and say, oh, you know what? I forgot. In order to receive that salvation, I need you to keep perfectly these 10 commandments. No. No. That doesn't work. God never breaks a promise. If God gave a promise with no strings attached, then God will meet his obligations with no strings attached. Anybody remember from a number of months ago, Genesis, one of my favorite verse in the Bible is? I know that some of you knew because when I spouted it out, you went and looked it up and some of you asked me, are you sure? It doesn't sound like a very good verse to me. Genesis 15, 17, which reads, when the sun had gone down and it was, da when it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. What a weird favorite verse. Pastor, you are a weirdo. It's okay, I live in that skin quite well. Do you know why it's my favorite verse? Because he ratified the promise. The promise was signed and sealed in blood. In that amazing covenant validating, ratifying agreement. God promised I will meet all my promises, all my obligation, even if it costs me my life. I will make it happen. And that's what the Apostle Paul is wanting to communicate. 
Don't let these people come along and steal your certain hope and your joy in God's promises by adding into it the conditions of the law as conditions of salvation. That's what he's saying. The covenant was validated in the most compelling terms. Read the whole 15th chapter. The promise, then, he goes on to say, was made to Abraham and to his seed. Now, Paul is making a very technical argument here, but an important one that people still fail to understand to this very day. Notice what he says. Verse 16, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring, singular. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is what? Christ. The Abrahamic blessing and to his seed was not to the Jews specifically, offsprings. It was to Christ, to Abraham and his true seed, Christ. Now, does that mean that the Jews weren't important and weren't involved in the process? No, that doesn't mean that at all. They were the instrument by which messianic preparation was accomplished and through which the Messiah was brought. But the blessings, remember, and to your descendants, your, your blessing will be to all the world. He wants us to understand that that is in Christ that all the world in God's mind, his plan of salvation was not through the law. It was through Christ, through faith in Christ. There are no two class believers. Gentile believers are not lesser than believers than the Jews. All who believe in Christ, Jew and Gentile, are equally blessed and the equal inheritors of all Abraham's blessings. We still cannot get that through our minds, and even to this day in the modern church. Christ is the center. Christ is the key, and only him. Those other things matter for many reasons. For many reasons they matter, but not in terms of salvation not in terms of the inheritance of blessing. It is through Christ and him alone, the true seed of Abraham. Now, already, Paul is in danger. Paul is in danger of something that's even a thought running through some of your minds even this morning. Well then, why the law? Why even bother with the law? If he's just going to save people through Christ and only through Christ, why even bother with the law? Why indeed? He answers that question for us. He'll actually build on it a little more next week as well. It was added, he says, because of transgressions. It was added because of sin. Quickly. Here's what he means by that simple statement. The law reveals something about us and about God. It wasn't given in order for you to earn your salvation. It was given in order that you might know your true condition. That all men might know their true condition. That they are not law keepers. That they are not perfect law keepers. It shows the truth of our sinful fallen condition. And at the same time, it reveals something about God, about his holiness. It shines a light on both of those things simultaneously. And about the people's call to be holy, to shine a light on who God is. The law can only pronounce one verdict on humanity guilt condemnation remember our journey through Romans chapter 8 earlier this year 
those wonderful words that the eighth chapter begins with, after he's unfolded this great truth about God's redemption, he begins chapter eight, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And in doing so, it prepares the way for people to see that they need a savior. That they cannot be right with God on their own. It shines a light on our disobedience and it shines a light on Christ's perfect obedience. And as he ends this section, it makes us all, all of mankind, the law makes prisoners. Prisoners with a guilty verdict in need of redemption. It perfectly sets the stage for the coming of Christ. The law is not opposed to the promise at all. But to misunderstand the purpose of the law is to begin to wander back into trusting in yourself and in your own abilities and works to be right with God. The law is brutal. Do you know that? The law is brutal. It simply holds out the standard. Some of you may remember that, uh, and I, I've lost track how many years ago, I, I taught a class through John Bunyan's great book, Pilgrim's Progress. Probably ought to do it again sometime. It's a wonderful journey. There's a passage in that book that reminds us of this truth so well and and introduces us to what he's going to continue to say next week in this next passage. Let me read you just a bit of that passage and set the context for you, if I may. Christian is well into his journey, and he's met up with faithful. And they're comparing about their experiences on this journey. And in this particular part, they're talking about their journey where they came to the foot of the hill difficulty and had to ascend it. And it it was a place where when Christian went up, he went on a resting spot for a little bit and fell asleep and lost his his word of God, his book, the word of God. And Faithful now is recounting when he came through that same stretch. Listen to what he says. About halfway up the hill, I looked back and saw one coming after me, swift as an eagle. This one overtook me where the arbor stands, this resting spot. Christian says, That is where I sat down to rest and went to sleep and lost this precious book out of my bosom. Faithful. Well, isn't that strange? But hear the rest of my story. As soon as my pursuer overtook me, he blurted out something and struck me a terrific blow. When I recovered sufficiently, I asked him why he did it. He said that because of my secret inclination to Adam the first... I rightly belonged to his house. Then he struck me again, completely knocking me out. When I came to, I begged for mercy. He said, the law knows no mercy. And with that, he knocked me down again. He doubtless would have killed me, but just then, one who freed me from the old man Adam came by and ordered him to desist, to stop. Christian, do you know who that person was? Faithful. I did not know at first, but as he went by, I saw scars. I saw scars in his hands and feet. I knew he was our Lord. Christian, that man who pursued you and attacked you was Moses or one of his men. Moses spares no one and knows no mercy. With him, all must pay the penalty of a broken law. His absolute rule is, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Do you see what Paul is cautioning the Galatians, indeed cautioning the whole church? Don't fall back into thinking 
that you can earn any part of your salvation. If you go back into the law at all, you receive the whole burden of keeping the whole law. The only rescue that is offered is in Christ, the true descendant of Abraham, the true mediator and only mediator of God's salvation and all his blessings of inheritance. Brothers and sisters, this table this morning, these are the signs and seals, not of works of the law. These are signs and seals of God's promise to us by faith. These are the free gifts of God's plan from before the foundations of the world of his great love for all that he would call to faith. These signs and seals are of God's blessings. The blessings promised to Abraham and to his seed and therefore distributed to all who are in that seed, all who are in Christ. Amen? Let's stand together and will you take your hymnals and turn to number 410. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 5.